Can you hear me back there? Oh, good, good. That's always good news at a presentation, isn't it? I want to welcome you to the very first TN Ethics Seminars this year. And we are so excited for a lot of reasons. First of all, I see some new faces, and I see some returning faces, and it's always good to see you. Thank you for coming. Um, for those of you who've not been here before, I do want to give you some of our ground rules. First of all, she says in her most witchy teaching fashion. Oh, by the way, I'm sorry, I'm Claudia McCullough. I'm the director of the uh, Ethics Center. This presentation is for an hour, and if you don't feel that you're going to stay for an hour, I would ask you to leave now. I find it extremely impolite to leave while someone is talking, and in other words, we just don't do it, okay? That's our first ground rule. Second ground rule that I had forgotten, turn off your cell phones, please. I just turned mine off, thank you. Third ground rule, the tea and the cookies are here for you guys. We mean for you to enjoy it. So if you get a feeling some sort of time during the presentation that you want another cup of tea or you want some more cookies, that's what it's there for. Please feel free to get up and serve yourselves. Here's our purpose today and our purpose in all of our tea and ethics. We want to start the discussion. We know that we can't answer all of your questions in an hour, but we also have faith that we can give you some real good questions to begin to think about. I always tell students when I was teaching, and I tell students and audience in these sessions, if you leave this room not talking about and not thinking about our presentation, then we have failed you. We really want you to go out talking about it. We want you to go out and look, go on the web, try to um, find some more information. So that's what this is all about. Now, let me introduce the speakers because I have a lot of excitement in today's speakers. First of all, I want to introduce to you Dr. Bowen Truluck. Dr. Bowen Truluck is a cardiologist in Myrtle Beach and he has been so kind as to give up a lot of time for us. I will tell you a secret, I never met Dr. Bowen Truluck. He was recommended to me by a friend. I had the nerve to call him on the phone and go, hello, could you do a tea and ethics? And he went, yeah. And I thought, ooh, <laughs> it's kind of scared me. And since that very time, he has been nothing but enthusiastic and has done a lot of research and has gotten me very excited because I've had the pleasure of meeting with him a couple of times. So Dr. Truluck is here from Myrtle Beach. Our other presenter is Dr. Phil Snyder, Emeritus Professor of Philosophy from Coastal. Phil and I have been at Coastal together a long, long time, so I always like it when his sweet face and intelligent face appears again. He's a bioethicist, but he's also a really nice person and a very intelligent person. So I'm going to turn this over to Bowen and to Phil, let them get started. And here's my promise again, my dear friends. Since I've asked you not to leave, at the end of an hour, I always call time. Those of you who have to leave may leave. We always have a lot of people stay because we want to keep asking questions. But that's always my promise. I'll always give you an hour and say, if you have to go to class or work, you can leave, okay? Any questions about what we're doing? I know you're gonna enjoy it. Get some good tea, get some of those good fattening cookies, because I'll be forced to eat them if you don't. And enjoy, thank you. Thank you, Claudia, and thank you all for being here today. Uh, I just wanna introduce this very briefly. Uh, advanced medical technology creates new and different ethical issues. Uh, it's been that way for the last 35 years. That's why bioethics has been uh, uh, a very, uh, fertile ground for academics, but more importantly because the ethics of medicine is where people live. Uh, as Dr. Truleck lives uh, through ethical issues in his practice, uh, I'm a member of the ethics committee at three hospitals in the area. We do ethics consults uh, all the time, uh, and I, I, I guarantee you that there are ethical dilemmas uh, that occur daily in, uh, in medical practice. So uh, we're gonna talk about one spe specific application area here today, the transplant of human organs, or other kinds of organs perhaps, uh, as well. And uh, we're gonna start, uh, Dr. Truluck will set the sort of the medical stage for you. It's important to have 
a good factual base before we worry about ethical issues. Uh, there are always in, in, in medical ethics legal overtones to medicine, uh, and so I will talk a little bit about some of the legal technicalities that apply to uh, organ transplants, and then I'll come back in and we'll uh, look at some of the ethical issues of uh, some ethical frameworks for uh, making or deciding, uh, working your way through ethical dilemmas, and we'll finish up with a couple of uh, live example cases. Uh, we want to leave at least 20 minutes in this hour uh, uh, for questions, so we'll try to go through fairly quickly. If you have questions, let's hold them until uh, uh, we finish with our, uh, our, our, our prepared presentation. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I want to thank uh, Claudia and Phil for allowing me to come and speak. Um, before this year, I really was never involved in ethics, especially in, in medicine. Um, actually, I was asked to be on the ethical committee at uh, Grand Strand this past year. And um, uh, with that, actually, uh, they asked me to be the chair of the, the committee. And the first call for the meeting, uh, first call for committee, uh, happened to be over the, the issue of organ donation. South Carolina just passed a new law. And it was uh, we were worried about how it would impact the hospital, impact the patients, impact what we do. Um, as a cardiologist, I have a very limited uh, role in the whole transplant. Uh, I'm not a transplant cardiologist. They're actually cardiologists that, that focus only on transplants and the care of patients that have gotten a cardiac transplantation. I'm more in the uh, process of actually working up the patient for transplant here at Grand Strand. But, uh, there was a change in the law, and I'll kind of touch on that a little bit uh, in, the, in the future with some of these slides. But that kind of brought this up to, for a question, and that kind of led to the discussion with Claudia and kind of led to the whole topic of doing organ transplantation. What I want to do, when we talk about transplantation, pretty much any part of the body can be transplanted. The majority of the discussion usually is with organ donation or organ transplant, which is a particular organ in the body, like the heart, the lungs, the pancreas. Uh, I'll, again, I'll touch on those. So when we're talking about transplant, you, you can, you can talk about a lot of things, blood transfusions, uh, bone, bone marrow transplants, skin transplants, but I'm going to kind of lead more towards the organ donation, organ transplant, and also towards uh, even heart transplant. I've got a little bit more data on the heart transplant. Uh, so let me go ahead and get started with these. And then to get the slides going, uh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, sorry. I'm not used to giving a talk. This is the first talk I've given in about five years, so please forgive me. Okay, John. Oh, this one. Okay. Yeah, tell me if you can't hear. If you can't hear, just stop me and say, listen, I can't hear, please. Okay, great. And I'm sorry with the... How do you... Oh, right here. Okay. And uh, again, I apologize. I'm a Mac and uh, in a PC world, and my slides actually, the, the pictures didn't transfer over to the, the PC, but I did have a picture of a lady drinking caffeine. You have to see it, but anyway, <laughs> be careful with the caffeine. It can lead to some certain syndrome. But just give some basic um, definition. Organ transplant basically is just moving of an organ from one body to another for the purpose of replacing that uh, damaged or failing organ with a working one from the donor site. Uh, when we talk about organ transplantation, the, the uh, donor can either be a living donor or a dead donor. Um, examples of a living donor would be a person giving a kidney transplant. We have two kidneys, so you can actually donate one of those and still live. But most of the uh, ethical issues, tend, and a lot, of, some of the ethical issues arise with the living donors, but most of them arise with the, the dead donor. Again, transplanted organs can, can range from a whole variety of different organs. The most commonly transplanted organs are heart, kidneys, lungs, pancreas, even the penis, the intestine. Certain parts of the intestine can be transplanted. A lot of tissue transplantations can occur as well. Bones, tendons, corneas, heart valves, which uh, you frequently will see, veins, uh, arms, and skin. Overall, worldwide, the most commonly transplanted organs are the kidneys. I want to give a little bit of a definition on just the types of transplants because that's important when we're talking in an ethical uh, standpoint over, over some of the issues. 
Uh, basically, an autograph is a type of transplant from the same person. Say if you, if you skinned yourself and had an injury and you wanted to try to heal that, you could take skin from one part of the body, transplant it to the other part of the body, and also, say, in a cabbage surgery, if you're taking a piece of vein from the leg and putting it into another part of the body, that's considered a transplant, although it's an autograph. Most of the transplants that receive the news, however, the allografts, where you actually have an organ or tissue between two genetically different uh, people in the same species, two non-identical members of the same species. Also, there, there are isografts, which are actually between genetically identical recipients as twins. So if you had two twins, you can transplant one organ to another. That's actually an ideal situation because you don't elicit an immune response and, and, um, and uh, the, uh, the graft tends to take very well. Xenografts are actually used as well, which is surprising. A lot of people don't realize this, but you can actually transplant from one species to another. A prime example nowadays is actually the porcine heart valves that are commonly used in heart surgery. Um, there's some other examples of actually taking fish pancreas and transplanting those into diabetics. They've had kind of limited, limited success, but uh, they're always looking at different things. One of the first transplants back in 1963 of heart transplants was done down in South uh, Africa, and actually the surgeon was ready to do the transplantation. The donor heart died, and so he quickly grabbed a uh, chimpanzee heart and transplanted that. I don't know if you remember that from the news, but uh, that didn't, take, didn't work very long, but it's been done even since 1963. Other types of transplants, split transplants, where you actually take one organ, divide it, and put it into two different people. That's usually more uh, commonly done with a liver transplant because actually you can take, um, and that's helpful because you can actually treat two patients. The downside is that whole organ tends to work better than a split organ. Finally, there's a, a type of transplant called a domino transplant. Using patients with cystic fibrosis, they'll develop extremely bad lung, lung disease, and they'll need a, you know, both lungs transplanted. The uh, idea, if you take the lungs, it's easier to take the lungs and the heart and transplant into somebody than just the lungs themselves because of the blood supply and the blood flow. So what you can do, that usually the uh, cystic fibrosis patients have a normal heart. The lungs are, are what's disease. So what you do, you take the heart and lungs from the donor, put it into the patient with the, with the, uh, that needs a lung transplant. You take his heart and transplant it into a different patient that may need a heart. So you actually two people benefit from one transplantation. And that's called a domino transplant. The uh, donor allocation system actually, um, there's a private organization that's under contract with the federal government called the United Network of Organ Sharing. And actually, they're, um, they kind of oversee all of the organ transplantation. We have some people from LifePoint here, so correct me if I'm uh, in the back. So correct me if I'm uh, mistaken. This is all, again, I had to research this. I was unaware of all the different uh, legalities and the way it was divided up in, in the country. Uh, for heart transplant, the U.S. is divided into actually 11 geographic districts. Um, South Carolina, it, ours is, goes from South Carolina to Virginia, over Kentucky and, and Tennessee, including North Carolina. The reason that's the case is because whenever you take, take a heart out and get ready to transplant it, you really only have four hours after you explant the heart, after you remove the heart, to put in the, the other person. So it kind of limits it from a national sharing. Uh, but anyway, there are 11 geographic uh, regions in the United States that are allowing uh, transplants to occur. Also, by having a larger area, you can actually have uh, a patient that uh, can accept a transplant more readily. You know, the, the, the match may be better. Under UNO's policy, thoracic organs are dis dis distributed based really upon three different, um, three different issues, the blood type, the medical urgency of the patient waiting, and the time on the waiting list. These can kind of be uh, uh, moved around a little bit, especially time on the waiting list. You can imagine if you have a patient that comes to a transplant uh, cardiologist, he says, gee, I need a heart. Um, the transplant cardiologist may say, well, let's wait until you really, really, really need that heart, and they'll put him on the transplant list later. That patient has less of a chance of getting a heart. He comes to see the transplant cardiologist, and he's not really that sick. The transplant cardiologist says, hey, let's go ahead and put you on the list now so you can really get a heart. He has an advantage. So sometimes just by the way that the transplant cardiologists will work, they kind of may benefit or may actually hurt a patient. But these are the, uh, the types of issues that will come up. Uh, currently, the highest priority is assigned to the severity of the illness. If somebody's at death's door, they don't think they can survive within the month, those people will be placed up higher, higher on the priority list, uh, which is actually um, Good for the patient if they can get the, the heart and the downside on that, the sicker they are, the less likely they are to do well. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. Um, but anyway, that's the way the system works right now. The highest priority do goes, does go to the people that are sickest. 
Transplantation medicine, this is really one of the most challenging complex areas of modern medicine. And really, as I mentioned earlier, the, the biggest problem is with organ rejection, uh, trying to prevent the body from uh, rejecting the new organ uh, that it sees as, as a foreign invader. Uh, the problem also keeping the organ in a functioning state where you're going from the donor to the recipient. Other major problem is a shortage of suitable organs. Uh, in most countries, this tends to be a, a big problem. Some countries are, are exceptions. India uh, actually had a law that you could uh, sell your kidney, and they didn't have a problem with, with kidney donation. The problem is uh, a lot of, and we can talk to, touch on that, that topic in a little bit, uh, a lot of the poor people end up selling their kidneys, and they're worse off before they did that, even though they got the money. It, it solved the, the, the problem of donation, but it, it leads to other societal problems. The rich tend to benefit when the poor uh, get sick. You know, it's not, not really a fair thing. Um, right now, I think the only country that actually allows selling of, of organs is Iran. Surprise, surprise. But um, anyway, that, that's the only country nowadays that does that. Other bioethical issues are raised, really the definition of death, when we try to find the point of death where we can actually take the organs. Uh, there is a move in medicine now to try to change the either definition of death or try to change the um, the uh, criteria for transplantation or taking the organs. It, um, there's a true org is a guy from uh, Massachusetts who writes a lot for the Human Journal of Medicine, and he's actually tried to say that we need to do away with the definition of, of of death and actually say, well, if somebody has irreversible brain damage, we should be harvesting their organs. And that, again, that's another kind of slippery slope of, of, of problems. You're actually causing the death of that indiv individual to gain the, the organs for transplant. So again, that's, that's another area of contention. Also, as we kind of touch about, is payment for the organs for transplantation. America currently is illegal. Most of the Western, Western countries, most of, East, most of the world actually is illegal for uh, payment for the organs. There is a very large uh, black market for organs. And actually, there are uh, people that would, the current countries that really promote uh, the black market and actually uh, transplant tourism is actually China. They would get a lot of their organs from their um, from the um, uh, prisoners, you know, prisoners that uh, really don't have any rights whatsoever. They would actually execute those prisoners, take their organs, and then sell them to people that were willing to come in and have them transplanted. It was really put to stop about a year ago, supposedly, but um, I'm sure it's still probably going on. But uh, a lot of stuff that really doesn't get out in the press. Um, successful human allotrans really been allotransplants really been going on for a long time. The operative skills were present really before the necessities for the patient to do well were, were discovered. In other words, they could actually transplant organs, but the patients really didn't do well. And that's been going on for a long time, and I'll show you some examples. The big problem with, uh, with uh, transplantation is rejection of the organ, as I mentioned, and also side effects of preventing the infection, uh, of presenting, preventing the rejection. The medicines that we use to prevent the rejection actually can cause an infection. They can also cause kidney damage very commonly and other, other problems that arise. Those are the two big problems are the infection. Now trying to decrease the immune response to the, the organ, you allow other opportunistic organs to, to attack the body. The really big break in transplant medicine came in the 70s when this when medicine came out, cyclosporin. It started being used in the 80s and it really changed the whole transplantation from a research surgery to more of a life-saving surgery. Uh, just kind of a uh, just kind of an idea of how things were going back in 1968 and 69, almost 100, 100 patients had heart transplant, but most of them died within about 60 days. Uh, in 1984, after cyclosporin started being used, two-thirds of all heart transplant patients survived five or more years. So much, much improved outcome. Just to give you a, a kind of timeline on some of the organ transplantations throughout the history, um, I want to kind of use my pointer, but I, I can't uh, talk on the microphone, so excuse me there. Uh, the 1905 was really the first successful cornea transplant, 1954 kidney transplant. It kind of seems unusual that back in 1905 they would have actually had a successful transplant, but really the cornea is an avascular area. It doesn't have a lot of blood supply, so you can actually transplant it. You don't have to worry about the, the blood cells going in there and fighting the cornea, and that's why they've been doing it for a long time and actually been successful. Um, really hadn't been used a whole lot, but it's been, been done for a long time. Um, really the first heart transplant, as I mentioned, was Christian Bernard down in, in South Africa. The patient lived for about 18 days after the transplantation, but it was a success. Unfortunately, there was a lot of press. He made it, uh, uh, it was really a press circus, you can imagine, back then. And so it was uh, kind of a lot of negative uh, response from the medical community at that time. 
Stanford did the first heart lung transplant back in 1981. Uh, you might remember recently, France, they did the partial face transplant on the, the person that had a, uh, uh, a damaged face. Um, interestingly, I was unaware of this, last year the first baby was born from a transplanted ovary. So it was really getting into whole new areas. And in 2008 also the human windpipe was, uh, was transplanted using a patient's own stem cells to generate that organ. So some pretty exciting pl pl uh, things that are coming up. Just to give you a little bit more history, um, really the first mention in, in literature was uh, uh, Chinese physician Pian Chao. He exchanged hearts between a man of strong spirit and a weak will with one of a weak spirit and a strong will to try to achieve balance. This was in the uh, second century BC, so probably probably didn't happen. I mean, it, was, it was interesting, but uh, probably didn't happen. Uh, two of my favorite saints, Damien and Cosmos, who were uh, saints of the doctors, uh, actually were reported to have replaced the gangrenous leg of a Roman Justinian with the uh, leg of a recently deceased uh, Ethiopian. Again, they could have done it, but probably probably didn't happen. Maybe for good talk. Actually, things that really did happen back in the second century BC, an Indian surgeon was using skin transplants on the same person to reconstruct the nose. So uh, that was going on for a long time. Again, infection back then was probably an issue. In the Renaissance period, in 1596, there was an Italian, uh, Gasparo Tagli Tagliacozzi, who performed really skin autographs on the same person. He actually would do that on different persons. He was really the first one to notice it, uh, the process of rejection. And he, he said it was uh, due to a force and power of the individuality instead of really knowing a little bit more about the, obviously in, at that time period, but really the first to report rejection. Um, all, all major medical advances usually occur at times of, of, of really world conflict. In World War I, they really got good at using uh, skin grafts and actually kept the pedicle and the person exchanging from one to another. Uh, World War II, obviously, in, in the uh, antibiotics were first widely used, and so those were two of the big impacts on transplantation surgery. In 1962, the first successful replantation surgery. Um, just to give you a little bit more background on hearts, most centers nowadays, actually 85% or greater one-year survival for their heart transplant, which is really good. These patients are extremely sick. They aren't really expected to live very long, and they're getting much better as far as survival. 90, 95% at some very good centers are not uncommon. Uh, the big improvement recently has been really in the first year treatment, uh, right after the post-operative phase and the first few months after transplantation, they've gotten much better at, at fighting infection, fighting rejection, and people do pretty well. After the first year, there's an attrition rate around 4% per year. Um, most recipients can, can expect about 10-year survival of 50%. Um, most patients after having a heart transplant report, report pretty good uh, functional status. Most of these patients, before they go to surgery, they can't even sit and, without getting short of breath and you know, much less walk across the room. But after a transplant, it's really a life-changing experience. They're able to get up, walk, you know, go out, and do, do more normal activities. Um, one interesting thing, and this is a point of a topic about trying to get people back to work, um, that's really a goal of therapy, trying to get people back into their, their job. Only about 40% of patients with a heart transplant can actually return to work after, after transplantation. Just to give two patient examples quickly, and then I'll let uh, uh, Dr. Snyder kind of take over um, on more of the ethical talk. Um, these are just two recent patients that are actually uh, presented. Interesting features about these cases, both of these two uh, patients had intracranial hemorrhage, which uh, you know, caused brain death in the patient. Uh, without trauma, and so they can actually go in and, and harvest the organs. The family consented after the patient presented, and actually they were able to use a liver for this, from the 65-year-old to a 44-year-old uh, reci recipient. The donor was 65, the recipient was 44, and she immediately had good function. They could not place the lungs just because there wasn't a match. Uh, kidneys could not be transplanted after evaluation. They looked, went in, the kidneys weren't uh, really suitable for transplant. Both corneas were used. One went to a 59-year-old female, and the other went to a 76-year-old female. And obviously, they harvest the uh, bones, connective tissues. They'll use more as products for other surgeries, orthopedic surgeries. Um, and so that's a very important part of the transplantation process as well. They go to so many different patients, it's hard to know exactly who they go to. Uh, they benefit so many different people. Another example is a 37-year-old who was pronounced brain dead due to, due to an intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, family consented to organ donation. Again, a, another patient received his liver, good function, heart and lungs could not be placed. Pancreas could not be transplanted after evaluation. It was used for research. Right corner went into one male, left corner went to another. 
and uh, bones and connective tissues from upper and lower extremities, again, were used for multiple patients. One interesting fact, and I didn't realize this, most of the uh, people that are pronounced a, or a, a donor, actually only about 50% of, of the hearts are actually used. Um, usually when somebody presents and they ask, we'll frequently get a call in the middle of the night and say, we've got a patient who's a SCOPA patient. Uh, SCOPA is the old name for the South Carolina Organ Procurement Center. Uh, now it's called LifePoint, and we have some LifePoint representatives out there. But uh, when they call us, we actually have to evaluate the heart to make sure it's a, a, a suitable heart for transplant. You don't want somebody getting a transplant to get a quote, quote, bad heart. So they go from one situation to another bad situation. So we'll come in and do what's called an echocardiogram, a sound wave test on the heart to look at the function of the heart, see the valves are working well. We'll also do a heart catheterization to look at the arteries and make sure the arteries are open. There's no stenosis there. Um, and, um, and then from that standpoint, the transplant surgeon will come in, they'll remove the organs and um, then um, Scoville will take over, LifePoint will take over and, and um, get the organs to where they need to be. That's kind of a brief medical uh, input of transplantation. I'll let Dr. Schneider take over now. Thanks, Bon. Uh, recycle occurs uh, in organs too, doesn't it? Uh, just like uh, soda cans. Uh, great, uh, great uh, setting the stage of the, the medical aspects. Uh, let me if I can make this work. Yeah. Uh, Bon mentioned uh, definitions of death. Uh, very touchy. LifePoint folks here uh, may want to uh, say a few words in the question and answer period. It's a wonderful organization that <coughs> works with uh, patients and families and, and, uh, uh, and treatment teams. The, uh, the organ uh, harvesting medical team is totally separate from the uh, uh, medical treatment team, so there's no conflict of interest between the, uh, <coughs> the two uh, 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 sets of folks. A whole brain death is, a, is, is, is uh, the definition which is uh, contained in U.S. law, the Universal Death Act of 1984, I believe. Uh, you have two, two parts of your brain. Your higher brain, your cerebrum, uh, in your skull, and the lower brain, which is uh, in the back of your skull towards the spinal column. And the lower brain controls all the autonomous uh, functions, blinking, gagging, heartbeat, uh, respiration all those things you don't have to think about to make happen. Uh, and uh, it can survive without the higher brain, without the cerebrum. Uh, and so there are really two kinds of brain death. One is whole brain, where both parts uh, die, and then there is higher brain death. Once the lower brain dies, of course, the body uh, no longer can function. So that's one definition. Another definition uh, uh, under the Uniform Defini Definition of Death Act is equivalent. Cardiopulmonary death is where you have the complete cessation of uh, res spontaneous respiration and heartbeat. Uh, and it, it really, uh, to, uh, to be totally dead, it has to be irreversible. And so you have to wait a little while to see if it doesn't reverse itself. Of course, in some cases it can be reversed uh, through technology. A heart-lung machine, a ventilator can keep the lungs operating. Uh, and so the definition of death gets a little fuzzy uh, when the patient is being kept alive only by a machine, and without a machine would be dead. And we'll come back to the ethics of that in just a minute. Uh, there's some, of, uh, some ethicists uh, have argued uh, uh, that we should uh, move to a different definition. Uh, that higher brain death means the death of the person, the personality, the cognitive reflexes, thought processes, uh, sensations of pain and pleasure, totally gone. Uh, you all, most of you probably remember the case of uh, of Terry Schiavo in Florida three or four years ago. Uh, she had uh, suffered from persistent vegetative state, uh, certainly was brain dead by uh, any indication, although her autonomous reflexes, her lower brain was still operating. You could see that on TV. Uh, but at autopsy, it was clear that her, her higher brain was not just mushy. Uh, it, it was just like a yolk of an egg, uh, and it was not functional. So even though it looked like she was functioning, uh, Cognitively, she was not. 
So the definitions of death are important from an ethical point of view, and we'll see why in just a minute. Uh, Bowen talked about usability. The organs have to be harvested uh, very rapidly as, as soon as, uh, as, uh, as long as they have blood flow through them. Uh, very long, what is it, seven, ten minutes, uh, and they become uh, more or less unusable. Uh, another sort of, uh, of uh, tag team match that occurs uh, uh, in organ donation uh, depends on uh, partly on the list and your, your location on the priority list for transplants, but a lot depends on blood type and uh, uh, you know the, the uh, compatibility between the donor and the recipient. And so sometimes the blood types uh, are not matchable, but we have three people in the vial. So we might take a heart from one person uh, and uh, give it to a relative of the second person, and that th third person then gets uh, a, a, do a donation from the second person. You see sort of a tag team sort of a match that occurs. Uh, it gets more and more complicated. In the United States, there are roughly 29,000 transplants a year, uh, and most of those, as you say, are, are kidney transplants, uh, but lots of others. Uh, the United Network for Organ Sharing is, is a nationwide uh, organization. Uh, LifePoint is the designated uh, 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 agency in South Carolina to manage organ, the organ transplant process. Uh, and this starts uh, with the family and with the uh, living will, if there's one, uh, and lots of consultations and preparations. It's a wonderful organization. Uh, there are the organ regis registries and recipient criteria uh, and, and priorities, and we'll see a little bit more of the ethics involved in that in a minute. Uh, some countries uh, have different kinds of laws than we have in the United States. Uh, in the United States, to, to donate an organ, you have to opt in. Uh, if you have a driver's license in South Carolina and you declare a willingness to be an owner organ, a donor, organ donor, uh, your license will have a little heart, red heart on it, uh, which identifies that you're willing to donate. Uh, and that is equivalent to a living will uh, executed uh, you know, formally. Uh, so that's an opt-in law. You opt in. You're not automatically giving a donation. You have to make a choice to do that. But there are many countries in Europe where the law is the opposite. It's opt-out. That is, you're automatically a, 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 an organ donor, uh, like it or not, unless you choose not to be, and then you show on your driver's license you're not a do donor organ, a donor organ, organ donor, right? Uh, so the presumption is, in these countries, is that your organs are available. Uh, if they're usable, uh, unless you have asked for them not to be. Uh, the question is, what's, what's the ethical view of those organs? Uh, do, does the patient own those organs? I mean, the donor? Uh, uh, if we have an opt-out kind of situation, the organs become community property in a sense, uh, unless you opt out. Uh, and one might ask uh, whether that's the ethical approach. Uh, we really uh, will look at, in just a minute at the, at the ethical principles surrounding that. Uh, there has been problems uh, in South Carolina and other states uh, where a living will has been executed by the, the patient. Uh, the living will says, I am willing to be a donor, organ donor. Uh, and when time comes, the patient is uh, maybe a, a brain hemorrhage, uh, as Bowen's examples, and uh, uh, is. Uh, it, comes a time to consider the transplant. Uh, the family's notified of the living will, and the family says, oh no, I, I don't think my, my, my relative would have wanted that to happen. Uh, we're not going to do that. And so the living will executed by the donor and the personal autonomy, a, a normal ethical value, uh, has been overridden by the family. Uh, and so the South Carolina Uniform Anatomical Gift Act, originally passed in 1970, was amended, I think, two years ago. Uh, to say uh, very, very, in no uncertain terms, that the living will and the, the license, uh, driver's license uh, annotation of, of the uh, willingness to donate uh, override any family wishes. And so uh, we find ourselves, uh, LifePoint, who's the LifePoint folks here? Uh, have you had ethical consults where that issue has come up between the family? Not with family. Okay, but it's, it's bound to happen. Uh, it will happen. It will happen, yeah where uh, you'll have to call the ethics committee for a consult because uh, the family says one thing and the patient says, I wanted it somewhere else, although the patient now can't exercise their, uh, their choice anymore. Uh, the National Organ Transplant Act, the federal law, 
does make it, as Bowen says, illegal uh, to sell or purchase uh, organs, although it happens all the time. Who's going to prosecute? Uh, let's talk a little bit about the ethical framework surrounding uh, medicine and, and specifically apply it to uh, the issue of organ donation. Uh, traditionally, uh, bioethicists talk about four core values of medicine. Uh, personal autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and social justice. Uh, they're pretty well self-explanatory in, in their terms, but in, in the organ transplant uh, milieu, let's say, uh, they have some special, special effects. Uh, personal autonomy is a value that, we, re that we, uh, we have hold very highly in the United States. Most of you insist on uh, making your own decisions, and particularly when it comes to medical treatment. Do you want treatment or not? You make the decision, not the doctors, not the hospitals, not the insurance companies. You make the decision. Uh, so personal autonomy is reflected in the organ transplant uh, world by the willingness to donate. Uh, and so the, the, the autonomy of the living will, executed, signed, witnessed, and witnessed uh, uh, reflects the uh, autonomy of, of the donor. Uh, and of course, if that's going to be the highest value, which is what the South Carolina law now says, it must be honored. Uh, beneficence is a value that really talks about the welfare of the patient. Uh, in this case, the welfare of the patient is the recipient. Uh, and the recipient, of course, as you, as you mentioned in the case of heart transplants, uh, a vastly different kind of life after the transplant has occurred than before. So certainly it's a matter of beneficence for the, uh, for the recipient. But there are those uh, in the world, in this country, who argue that organ sharing, organ donating is a, a ghoulish kind of thing, is something that uh, uh, it's a Frankenstein kind of uh, approach to human relations and uh, really has some kind of uh, basic uh, uh, immorality attached to it. But this principle of beneficence says the opposite. It says we're doing good here. Uh, we're helping people who, who dramatically need it. Uh, and that's a good thing. Uh, Non-maleficence is a value uh, catchphrase, of course, is first do no harm. Uh, Non-maleficence means don't be malef maleficent. Uh, who are we harming in organ transplants? Well, one, there's an argument that, uh, that the donor is being harmed, that somehow we're hastening the death of the donor in order to harvest the organ while it still has blood in it and has a chance to be, uh, to be effective. Uh, and so there are some uh, ethical issues around that. We'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, social justice is a value that says, uh, other things being equal, we operate for the benefit of the most uh, people who can achieve it. Uh, and of course, this is why we have uh, organ uh, donation uh, listings, why we have priorities. Uh, we'll, we'll argue a little in just a minute about uh, the social justice of the priorities that are applied to, uh, to donation. But that's a value that applies here. Now, the overriding issue uh, uh, in, in, in organ donation from, quote, dead persons uh, is the, the, the traditional dead donor rule, quote. I say, quote, because it's not in law. The dead donor rule is not in the law. There's no law that says you can only transplant organs from people who are dead however you want to define dead. But it just seems right that we wouldn't kill somebody to take their organs. That seems to be a sort of a fundamental uh, basic uh, of value that we can all sort of identify with. Uh, but the definitions of death come into play here. Now, if, if the dead donor rule applies, then the patient has to be dead. Now, how do we define death? Bring us right back to the two kinds of death, whole brain, cardiopulmonary. They're not exactly the same. Uh, and then the issue of, of higher brain death. The uh, Terry Schiavels of the world are, are suffering from PVS, persistent vegetative state. Uh, the vast majority, 99% of people who are in a PVS state never recover. Terry Schiavel had been in a PVS state for about 12 years. Uh, her husband wanted to, re to take her off life support. Uh, she could breathe on her own because her, her lower brain was operating, <clears throat> but she had to be fed artificially. And uh, if we'd stop feeding, as eventually they did, of course, uh, in about seven days, she died uh, from, uh, from starvation, in effect. Uh, but her organs could have been used. So if we have a PBS patient who's got a 99,999 out of 100,000 chance of not coming back, uh, would that argue that that patient's organs could be harvested? We'd just stop uh, you know, maintaining their life support? Uh, again, it, it, it seems 
ethically strange to say we would take one person's life, all the argument then comes is, is, is the brain dead person really still a person or not? There's a lot of philosophical arguments around that. But it, obviously it raises a lot of issues. Uh, the opt-in, uh, opt-out laws in effect say that everybody has a moral obligation to donate their organs if they're usable. Uh, but of course your obligation to do that can be outweighed by your value of personal autonomy to decide not to. So as not uncommon, we have a number of moral values that are in conflict with one another. Uh, that's what makes ethics sort of interesting. Uh, Bowen mentioned the selling of organs that occurs. Uh, a great fear, of course, is the organs will be sold by people who are poor uh, in order to get money. Uh, and they put themselves at, uh, at advanced risk in terms of the future of their life. Uh, it may be an advanced risk that the rest of society then has to pay for uh, through the emergency departments of, of hospitals and, and things like that. So. Uh, commercialism in organs doesn't seem like a very good idea. Uh, there are cost factors involved. Obviously, it's very expensive. Uh, a heart transplant can cost a million dollars. Uh, I guess the heart and lung is even more expensive. Uh, and then you have others that are lesser expensive, liver, kidney, cornea. Uh, blood transplants uh, are, are obviously the cheapest. Uh, so should cost matter? Should we? not transplant organs like hearts that are very expensive, but go ahead and transplant corneas which are relatively inexpensive. And should there be a cost factor there or is cost no, no object? Uh, clearly cost is an object. We've been watching TV over the last eight, nine months uh, in terms of the healthcare system in the United States. So cost factors have to be uh, considered to some degree. As far as priorities for organ uh, recipients, uh, what should they be? Uh, should they, we only transplant white hearts to white people and black hearts to black people? Uh, does race have anything to do with the operational heart? Obviously not. Uh, ethnicity, gender. Uh, we have female hearts implanted in males, vice versa. Uh, and so that, that seems to work okay. So gender doesn't seem to be a, an appropriate uh, ethical uh, priority. Uh, how about lifestyle? If a person is an alcoholic, uh, and they, in effect, have destroyed their liver, and they're an alcohol-related end-stage liver uh, disease, uh, should they get a liver? Did they bring this problem on themselves? And they, through autonomy, uh, an autonomous uh, uh, imbibing uh, and, and overdoing alcohol, have they then forfeited their right to be on a, on a recipient list? Or should they just be lower down, maybe never get reached? Uh, this came up with uh, Mickey Mantle, if you remember him. Uh, and he was an alcoholic, uh, but he got jumped way up on the, on the recipient list. Uh, I don't think it was, it was geographically determined. He was, of course, played for the Yankees, and I guess he was living in Texas, but uh, anyway, he got a liver uh, a lot sooner than he would have gotten uh, uh, if, if, uh, if the uh, alcohol-related factor was, was, was a priority uh, a decider. Social worth. Or though to we decide who's more important to society's uh, well-being, and then uh, put them high up on the transplant <coughs> list, and who would decide that? Obviously, it'd be a difficult thing to do. Uh, medical need is uh, is typical, as one mentioned, uh, is one of the important factors for uh, priority on, on on receiving a a donor organ. Uh, but one might question uh, that. Uh, we've been, I've been working recently with uh, uh, co-chairing of South Carolina Task Force on Influenza pandemic ethics, and uh, the model of medicine in that situation changes. We don't really endeavor to treat uh, uh, the sickest patient because there are lots of sickest patients. Uh, we endeavor to treat those patients who have the best chance to survive, which means that scarce resources like ven ventilators and, and ICU beds go to those who have the best chance to survive, not the sickest. Right now, the model of medicine that's being used for transplanting uh, is the sickest get priority. Uh, and in the normal situation where resources aren't scarce, that makes sense. But of course, organs, in effect, are, are scarce. There are, at any one point, 100,000 some odd people on the, donor on the recipient lists for various organs, and 29 to 30,000 uh, receive them. So it's only one out of three, basically, uh, who are receiving organs. So it, it is a scarce resource. Uh, waiting time seems to be a sort of a fair thing. Uh, if, if you come up to a, a line at the bank, uh, you shouldn't jump ahead just because you're you, 
Uh, the people who've been waiting in line longer than you seem to have a, a better, uh, higher priority ethically uh, for service. And so the time waiting seems to be a, a defensible sort of thing. Geographic location wouldn't matter otherwise except for the fact that uh, some organs can't transplant uh, uh, very well, very far away. And so I think kidneys can be put on, on ice and transported, can't they, across the country? But uh, I, I've seen, well, I think I've seen on TV. I don't know if that, that's true or not. But uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, you can see the ethical principles here uh, can conflict with one another. Uh, and when ethical principles are in conflict, you can't just walk away and say, oh, well, that's too bad. Uh, you have to make decisions, uh, particularly in terms of people's uh, survival and, and as far as medicine goes. And so <coughs> conflicts that occur between autonomy and social justice, beneficence and non-maleficence must be uh, resolved. Now let's look at a couple of cases here, uh, three real cases and one I made up. Uh, the first one I made up, we got a healthy person with great heart, good lungs, uh, 45 years old. Uh, we've got two patients uh, 45 years old apiece. Uh, patient B is failing heart, will die without a heart transplant. Patient C has lung disease and will, let's say uh, cystic fibrosis and will die without a lung transplant. Well, uh, if we take a straight utilitarian ethic, the greatest good for the greatest number, what should we do? Kill the first patient, right? Take his heart and lungs. You save two for the price of one, a twofer. So obviously that's not going to be a sort of value that we want to, uh, to, uh, to uh, promulgate, I would think. I say obviously. Uh, and why is that? Uh, well, there seems to be a moral distinction that's important uh, between killing a person and letting a person die. Unfortunately, in medicine, patients are let die all the time because either we can't save them or we don't have the resources uh, to treat them. Uh, but we don't kill patients, uh, and, so, and we don't kill people who are healthy. And so killing seems to be somehow worse than letting patients die, even though in this notional example, if we kill the first patient, uh, two other patients will live longer. Maybe not, you know, a lot longer, but longer. Uh, and does that seem like a good trade-off to make? Uh, one argument might be that if we have an opt-out, or actually we, we, we pass a law which you can't opt out or in either one, you're automatically in a lottery. You get a lottery number, and everybody's in it, so we have 300 million people in the lottery in the United States. Uh, your chances of coming out to be a donor is not very, very great, but if, you, if you're picked to be a donor, then uh, you'll sacrifice yourself for saving your organs, uh, you know, four or five other people. That doesn't seem to be an ethically uh, uh, sort of robust sort of system to have either. So let's forget the twofers. Uh, the second example of Ken Duke in 2002 is a patient, uh, a, a heart patient, uh, in prison. And uh, his lawyer, he had heart failure and he needed a transplant. The only way he was going to survive. And his lawyer argued that it was cruel and inhuman punishment for him not to have an organ transplant uh, because otherwise he was going to die. And we were as cruel and inhuman to let him die in prison. Uh, and so the prison authorities decided to go ahead and jumped him up on the priority list. It's a true story. Uh, and he got a heart. Uh, it cost about a million dollars, and he lived about a year. Now, this is a lifestyle question. Should patients in prison have high priority or any priority uh, because they placed themselves in prison at their own personal autonomy? Again, we've got to value autonomy and beneficence uh, sort of in conflict. Uh, early on in terms of allocation criteria and the role of, uh, of governments in that, uh, we have governments involved today. Uh, LifePoint's a contractor to the U.S. government. Uh, the main, main, maintainers of the priority list, contractors to the U.S. government. So government has a role here in allocating uh, scarce resource, particularly one that's life and death uh, involved in medicine. Uh, is that the appropriate thing for government to do? Well. It seems like it probably is. So from an ethical point of view, who else is going to do that? Uh, this, this goes back to uh, the early days of uh, kidney dialysis, which is for people who are, whose kidneys are failing, uh, two or three times a week they run their blood through a cleaner. It takes three or four hours for that to happen. Uh, and uh, in early days, the dialysis machines were scarce. And we had more patients failing kidneys than we had dialysis machines. How to allocate 
uh, the machines. And so the government, in this case the, the town government of Brattle, Texas, stepped in and uh, set the priorities. Uh, sort of a, a, uh, a precedent for the, what's going on today in a broader sense. Uh, the last case I wanted to mention is the death row convict. He's on death row. He's convicted of murder. Uh, he's going to be executed. Uh, the average time on death row in the United States today is 13 years uh, until your case is finally allocated, uh, allocated and, uh, uh, and all the courts have acted and, and you're ready to die. Uh, so that's 13 years. States have reasoned that uh, kidney dialysis, again, cruel and unusual punishment to deny dialysis. Uh, in fact, the U.S. law now, the Medicare law, provides that everybody who needs dialysis can get it. Uh, and so there's enough money to, to buy enough dialysis machines. Uh, and so this, uh, this convicted murderer gets a, tr a kidney transplant because the transplant cost is cheaper than dialysis. Uh, and so now we have the economic factor coming in to say, oh, well, let's uh, put him on a high priority list because it's going to cost the state a lot more to, 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 to dialyze him than it is to transplant his, uh, trans, uh, uh, plant his kidney. Uh, once again, the mixed up sort of ethical principles uh, in conflict. and. Uh, I'd be interested in hearing uh, how you all think we should uh, resolve these, uh, these conflicts. So we've got about 10 or 15 minutes. We started about five minutes late, so maybe we have 15 minutes, uh, Claudia, for uh, comments and discussion. Okay. Um, now let's take some time for questions or comments to our two presenters. And in about 15 minutes, I'm going to call time for students who have to leave. But um, basically, they take questions or comments first. Who has a question or a comment? I have something. I want to say this before I forget. I got, for those of you who don't know this, and I didn't know it, I've been a state employee for more years than those of you who've been alive, and I did not know this, the South Carolina state employees, um, eligible employees have, who are entitled to leave of absence without loss of pay, time, or leave in any one fiscal year, for a period of not exceeding 30 regularly scheduled work days, employees who are donating in order. And don't all of all them go out and donate in order, so you can get a vacation. But so that's state-supported state uh, encouragement. I did not know that. Yeah. Why do you want to read that out today? Let, let me stop for just a minute. Uh, uh, do the folks from LifePoint want to add to anything to what we said? Because your, your organization is a great organization. Could you explain to everybody what LifePoint is? <laughs> Thank you. I'm Nancy Taylor, I'm the CEO of LifePoint, which is the Oregon Dental Program in South Carolina. And thank you for this presentation um, this evening. Um, uh, one thing I'd like to add, I think that I'm not sure what brought up, which is a real dilemma, I think, for uh, recipients in our state and nationwide, is the uh, effect of trying to return to work. And it's a main dilemma because in some areas, our insurance is set up such that if you have a pre-existing illness of which heart transplant is considered a, a severe medical condition, um, they will not be covered. So businesses can't afford to rehire transplant patients because their insurance will not cover them. Um, so that's a huge dilemma that we have in our, in our country um, because most heart transplant patients and many other transplant patients are very eligible and healthy and willing to go back to work. They can't afford to go back to work because they have insurance will not be covered. Um, secondly, um, cost factors of transplantation. Uh, there is a lot of controversy over whether the cost is worth it um, for our society to transplant patients. Um, and you have to consider the amount of cost, I think, for the transplant itself um, versus end-stage um, uh, organ failure and medical care of those patients who can remain in an intensive care unit for a very long time. So there is, there's, you have to weigh a lot of things in transplantation. And um, I think with the scarce resources that we have, we try to do the best that we can. Um, there are a lot of ethical issues and dilemmas that we're faced with. Um, and, and the main reason, I think, is, is, is that we do not have a lot of yes, patient close to my heart. So um, I encourage any of you who are interested
interested in organization and transplantation to learn about it. Educate yourselves about transplantation and organ donation. Um, don't watch TV, uh, go to the internet and read true stuff about it. And then make your decision whether or not you want to become a donor. Um, and you can also uh, get on the South Carolina Donor Registry that was just enacted um, in January of this year. Um, and you can make your personal wishes known. I do have some individuals here with me that you can, you might find interesting to talk to. Um, Mary Hill, um, her daughter Kendra was an organ donor. How many years ago, Mary? Fifteen, Fifteen years ago. Um, and then we have Mr. and Mrs. Sykes here with us. Their son died waiting for a lung transplant. Any of y'all have anything you want to comment on or say? I, I just like to let everyone know that I appreciate you being here and, and having uh, an interest in organ donation. Uh, that's the first step in, in becoming a donor, is having an interest in helping your fellow man, your family member, or even a complete stranger. Uh, in our case, we didn't get the organ. And the reason was, there wasn't enough out there to go around. So, you know, I, I urge you to become an organ donor. Thank you. Yes, sir. Sure it's been made as to why people do not donate. Nancy? Did everybody hear that question? Yeah. Is there any uh, 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 sort of common reason why people don't want to donate? Nancy? In religious, uh, yeah. There's a lot of. Um, myths about donation. Um, there's no religion, no, no common well-known religion that prohibits donation. In fact, most religions Shinto is the only one. Shinto is the only one in Japan. Shinto and yeah. Gypsies. Mm -hmm. right. Gypsies right. kind of been classified as a religion. The Pope is very encouraging of, of The Pope of, is. Most, uh, most all religions in our country are very um, <coughs> supportive of donation as a, as a last act Human, uh, human man. Um, other, I mean, people have their own personal interests. I mean, the, the comments that we get from individuals is, well, Mama came with, she's doing what she came with, or, you know, people think I can't get to heaven if I don't have all my organs. Um, but uh, there's a lot of people that get to heaven that don't have some organs, <laughs> I hope. But, so there's a lot of myths out there. Part of our effort statewide, um, and, and Mary and Allie and Jane are both volunteers with LifePoint, is to go out and try to dispel those myths and, and make people understand that organ donation can be good, and it can be good for families after the fact, and helping them, um, uh, I think, dwell on something other than the death of their loved one. Um, Mary has volunteered with us ever since her daughter became a donor. Let me ask uh, the, the audience, uh, do you think the dead donor rule is a good rule? They probably need to say it again. Do you think the dead donor rule? They about the dead donor rule. Oh, the dead donor rule is, uh, quote, rule is that you don't take organs unless the person's dead. Does that, that make sense? Well, how about an alternative? Uh, there's a view that says, okay, if we take the organ, uh, we're killing the patient. We're killing the, the donor. But if the donor uh, is, in effect, uh, brain dead through hemorrhage or trauma, uh, the donor is, uh, very, very frequently is being maintained on artificial ventilation, right? Being helped help to breathe. <coughs> Excuse me. And so without the ventilator, the patient would die. Uh, and this becomes an issue in uh, in hospital ethics consultations, do we take Granny off the ventilator knowing she's going to die? Uh, and if the physician recommends that, we're, uh, there's no hope. Uh, we're using the ventilator for a person who can't, uh, uh, in effect, uh, get any benefit from it. Uh, so we wean her from the ventilator in, in very humane, palliative care, comfort care kind of a way, and she dies. Now, did taking the ventilator away kill her? No. The underlying disease killed her. Uh, and so 
the dead donor rule, if we, if we make it too strict, uh, organ transplants would probably come to a halt. Uh, and so uh, I think there's, there's room, Bowen mentioned, uh, uh, there's been some, a lot of discussion in New England Journal of Medicine about this issue. Uh, and I don't think organ donation is killing the donor. Uh, whatever the donor has uh, is killing the donor. Now, if we put the donor into a transplant process prior to the instant of natural death, uh, are we violating the dead donor rule? Uh, the patient the donor was going to be dead anyway. Uh, it seems to me that we have maybe in this country uh, painted ourselves into a, uh, an ethical corner uh, with the strict dead donor rule. Uh, and I expect to see a lot of uh, discussion about that. I'd, what do you all think? Yeah, Donna? Why can't they take the law that says you cannot put I mean, you're living on life support. You're not here. You're already dead. Your brain is dead. Why can't they make a law that says no more life support? That, that, that's the, it's the good. <laughs> When you say they're already dead, that's the, the question is getting the diagnosis of death because if you, if you actually, and the big question from a physician standpoint, you know, our, our whole modus operandi is keeping somebody alive. That's, and so when you talk about organ transplant, we have to, you know, you're, you're going against your whole training, you're going against everything else. Um, and speaking to a lot of physicians, and I've had, had there are cases where I've noticed that people that are considered quote unquote brain dead, even going for organ transplant and actually a reflex will happen, the physician will say, oh, no, they're still alive. I'm not going to touch them. And it's because of the way we were trained to help people, it's hard to kind of put all that aside and not. Um, and it, a lot of people have a lot of problems because if you take somebody that's not brain dead, and this, this was a definition made by Harvard in 1968, um, the, the dead brain. It, before that point, most people thought that the lungs and the heart had to stop to be considered dead. And now that the Harvard has this definition of brain death, um, it really has to be the, the cerebral, you know, the upper cortex and the lower part of the brain to be considered dead. You can still have spinal function and be considered dead. Um, well, physicians don't want to, I mean, because if you, if you actually take somebody with lower brain stem function and harvest the organs, you're, you're killing them, you're, you're performing murder. And physicians don't want to be in that position of performing, you know, killing the patient. I mean, I, we know there's a societal good, but that's the whole rub. I mean, that's a big rub for a physician. When you're, you know, this is a patient you've taken care of for many years, you get to know them very well, you get them to a point where they're, you know, on life support, um, you know, it's, 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 it's hard. You can't do that, and that's it's a bad... Yeah, one, one way to, to, uh, to approach that, South Carolina uh, uh, has a, uh, a formal process of of uh, uh, medical power of attorney. And uh, that's, it's like a living will. In fact, living will is incorporated into it. Uh, and that's where you can uh, specify your wishes at the end of your life. Uh, and one way to specify your wishes, and this is actually a choice you can check on this form, is I do not wish to ma be maintained artificially, uh, either through a ventilator, a breathing assistance, or through heart uh, uh, assistance or through artificial nutrition and hydration. You have different choices you can make. So if you checked, I don't want any of those things, and for some reason you're on life support, like you were brought into, let's say, a trauma emergency department, uh, and put on, put on a ventilator just temporarily to see if you could, could, uh, could be you know, resuscitated, uh, and you can't, then the process of organ donation can begin because you've already specified that you don't want that. Now, I understand the physician's view that if there's still autonomous reflexes, the patient is, quote, alive because the lower brain is still doing what it does. Uh, but it seems to me there's, some, there's some, a place here for, uh, for a compromise at some point. Nancy? in this building, and you can use it personally for classes, 
whatever you want to. But I have promised you that at 5.30 I would tell you all time. But we did not applaud. Somebody back there has to pick up her child and she's already told me. So please feel free if you have a class, but we're going to stay and talk a while if you want us to. I'm sorry. It's not on the future that you should say this is an hour and five minutes. I think Nancy had a response to my conjecture. Sorry again, I apologize. Okay. The one thing that I wanted to uh, make sure, because the question was about a living will, and to whether or not a person, uh, you know, you, you don't want to be maintained on a ventilator or any medical apparatus or whatnot. And I think people need to understand that for the most part, um, patients who become donors are declared brain dead and they, their um, blood flow and heartbeat have to be maintained for the organ function to be viable. So if patients are removed from the ventilator that want to be a donor, chances are they're not going to be. Because those organs will not remain viable. So a lot of people, um, you know, they can choose to, to say, I don't want to be, you know, maintained on the ventilator except for organ donation or whatever. Um, they're actually doing some inventive things. Uh, I just read an article in the journal that came out two months ago with babies that they're considered to have no cerebral function. They're actually to the point where the family wants to donate their organs. They're actually allowing them to go through cardiopulmonary arrest. And actually, they have the transplant team waiting and the other uh, recipient waiting. And actually, they'll wait a minute and then take the heart. And so they're actually still able to have death. And, Interesting, and, and, yeah. um, that process is called donation after cardiac death. Right. And that was the process that we used back in the late 60s before brain death was actually legalized in the United States where you would have a patient who would have severe brain injury or have some upper um, uh, spinal injury where they, would, they, they could not maintain spontaneous respirations and ultimately would die. Um, these patients are in a controlled situation. Um, in our case, most, all of the families have, have decided that they're going to withdraw care from their loved one and allow them to die. Um, and what happens is once the heart stops on the control situation and after about a minute or two, uh, I think our, our policy is what? Two, three minutes. But some hospitals have yes. five minutes. Yes. For the interval between when the heart stops and when the organ recovery can actually start. So once the heart stops, then the organs can be recovered. Generally, in most cases, it's only liver and kidneys, however, because um, you don't want your oxygen not to go to your heart very long. Um, I, I work at Commonwealth um, Center University Department. And um, I, I recently read our policy on organ donation. And, um, it, in the patient is removed from the ventilator in the OR setting with the surgeon. The transplant team is not allowed to touch the patient until the, the patient is officially dead and pronounced by the, the physician in the room. 
and then they have to stay out of the OR until that happens, and then they can come in and begin the organ harvesting process. And I just I, I wanted to mention that because some people, That's you know, good. that that perceive you know perception of that we're killing them, that we're actually we let them physically die and pronounce death, and then the organ harvesting. I think that's one of the reasons that you only have 50% of the South Carolinians do say yes, they want to donate, but 50% say they don't. I think that's a big issue. People are afraid that, you know, if, if I donate my organs, they're going to kill me. You know, I'm going to go ahead and they're going to, when I go in the hospital, they're just going to take my organs out if I look halfway dead. That's not the case. It's very strict and it's very, um, it's very strict criteria. And actually, you're taking care of pretty, pretty well up to the point of, I mean, actually, very aggressive care. It's very point. aggressive medical yeah. care for organ donors because. A lot of people think you can just take an organ out and transplant it to someone else. Well, if that organ is not very viable and functional, then it's not going to do any good to transplant it to anyone. So. Okay. Um, Sorry, I'm just going to go The South Carolina Health Care Power of Attorney asked the individual who was signing it whether or not they want to grant their agent the right to donate their organ. They make that provision. That comes before you make a decision as to whether or not you're granting your agent discretion with regard to your health care. There's three options. Discretion with regard to your health care, no discretion, no treatment, no discretion, maximum treatment. Okay, so you make that decision about whether you want to donate your organs. And at that point, I I'm not sure what the law is right now, but I would argue that if it's not personal property, it's at least quasi-property or working. And so while you are confident, you have the right to make the decision whether or not you want to do it or you still make that decision. Well, that's true. But of course, at the point of donation, you're normally no longer competent. Pardon? You're no longer decisional if you're... You've already made that decision. I know that at that point. But at the point of, of, of the donation actually beginning uh, medically to occur, you're beyond the point of Big decision. The point of the health care power of attorney is to appoint somebody to carry out your wishes right. and make those decisions. And the, and, and the, and the recent uh, amendments to the law uh, do not allow, <laughs> as I read it, uh, do not allow that to be overridden even by those who have the power of attorney. The, um, that's right. So you make the decision right now. Once it's made it and documented, it's that, so that's what it is. It's in the, but, but if you have not made the decision, if there's no decision, your family is asked for that. They can make it. If you know, I have a call situation, and I don't know who called, but whoever did should burn. A friend of mine's husband died recently, very suddenly. She, she called me in the middle of the night at 4 o'clock in the morning. I was at her house trying to tend to her, and the phone started ringing. And I am so sorry, whoever the man was, I, it was such chaos. He kept saying, you know, you need to donate those organs. And I was like, oh, wait, I'm not, the, I'm not the spouse. Well, I need to talk to the spouse where she is on the floor. I'm trying to save her. This man called that house five minutes. And I will not say to you what I said to him the last time. It was horrible, and she's in tears. And she's saying, does he think I'm horrible because I won't donate? I don't know what, why would I want it? And, and I don't know who that was. I never, I, mean, I didn't know they should, should or could do that. This man actually died out of town, so I don't even know how he got this phone number. But between the hours of 4 and 5.30, there were five phone calls into the home. Well, I, I would say that the Life, life Point has a very thorough counseling well, process. I mean, yeah, uh, with families, is, who does that? that wouldn't be life point. No, I'm not accusing. I'm sorry. I just wondered if you think. Hey, I, think I think. I think the point I is, the is the, of what you're trying to make, and I think the real point of the conversation is, if people get on the registry, then families don't have to make that decision. And and I think that um, you know, there's a lot of questions about if the patient's on the registry, how are you going to treat the families? Are you just going to go in and say, here we come? No, we're not going to do that. We are going to interact with families the same way that we always do, and that we are going to care for them and notify them that they're, we have had, our registry was instituted in January, and we had to start off at zero. Um, 
And now we're up to about 250,000 patients uh, or people in the registry. So far we've had three organ donors and I think four tissue donors off of the registry. And I think the main thing is, is these families don't have to worry about what the decision was because the decisions have already been made. I guess that's really not my question. My question is, is that going on in this state? I honestly do not remember the chaos yeah, at home was so severe. I honestly do not remember how he identified himself, but it was quite scary. And he kept saying to me, and I wasn't even in the house, where am I shine? Where am I shine? And the body wasn't even in Myrtle Beach at the time. Now, is that happening in the state? Because if that's happening, I can tell you why people don't want to donate. And well, in fact, I will tell you that the spouse of the man that died, my dear friend, has taken her name. Well, if, if there are, hospitals are required to notify us when there's a death in the hospital that a potential donation can occur. And there are time limits on such things. In the case of tissue donation, yes, we try to contact the next of kin as soon as possible to find out if that patient was a donor. Um, and sometimes it's very difficult to find the, find the families. Um, because a lot of times families don't go home. I don't know the circumstances or, or what you're, you know, talking about, but um, we do call families sometimes in the middle of the night to find out what the wishes of the next of kin are, or if the, now if the patient is in the registry to notify them and ask if they have any other, you know, uh, knowledge or information. So. I don't know, I mean, our people are highly skilled and trained to contact people. Um, so I, I can't answer that question for you. Yes, sir. Uh, there, are, there are issues of how the family is being treated. Uh, for instance, my brother died two years ago, and while he was, and his, when we knew he was going to die, two men came into our lives who represented themselves as, as grief counselors and patient advocates. Once my mother was pronounced brain dead, they exactly what happened, what she was described happened. We were bullied into, into uh, organ donation. Bullied? So, yes, that is that. Yeah, I mean, I mean what, that's, that, that, that's a greater death toll. Like, you know, if the patient wants to, to donate, I mean, I, I'm all for it. I, I mean, I've signed, I want to donate my organs. But I love one of the ethical someone come in and try to bully someone else to or, or donate someone else's works. And you feel that you were bullied in I was absolutely bullied. Well, my sister was actually bullied. Let me ask you a question, Nancy. Um, the, or, the, the registry is being loaded automatically by DMV, right? Anybody that checks off that they want to be a right. donor at the DMV, it, that information um, goes into the donor right. registry. So you've got already 250,000 people, mm -hmm. uh, and you have many people who have executed the uh, living well and durable medical power of attorney indicating the same thing with or without the driver's license. So my question is, is that enough of a, a base of a, a donor base where you could operate just with those people who have made that option? No, sir. That wouldn't be enough. Okay, got a question over here. Because only 1%, less than 1% of all patients who die, die in the circumstances that they could be an organ donor. Many, many more can be tissue donors. Okay. All right, gentlemen, back. I work as a security officer at Florida Hospital. I've seen a lot of patients come in that were dead and family. Like the gentleman's talking about his green stroke to the point that no matter how it's approached, if it's the situation they described, or I've seen doctors of solid just for telling someone he's dead. If we, I mean, if you go into an ER or an emergency room today, they won't talk to you about your tobacco use. But anytime I've been into an ER or a doctor's office, nobody wants to sit down and discuss organ donation with me. Why, why, why don't we have that discussion? At that end of it, where your primary care provider is discussing this with you, well before it becomes necessary, 
and the rest of the family knows what your options are, mm -hmm. just like when you do the back of course. I think that was the intent of the, the new law, because before, basically, th what the law said on your driver's license with a little heart, your intention was to donate. So it was just an intent to donate. Now with the new law is your consent to donate. And so if you've signed the, the if you check the box, right, and physicians, you know, you, obviously we're squeezed and squeezed with time and time. Right, I know. The person at the Right, exactly. It's crazy. But, right, exactly. The problem is, who, who, how, how are you going to get the doctor? Most of the patients don't go to doctors. Most people don't go to doctors, especially the, the right age group for organ donation. Between 20 and 50, people don't really see physicians on a routine basis. Though, that's the key age for organ donation. Well, what about emergency care? That, that'd be a... If I go into an ER, right. before I get through, one of the first things they want to ask me is about the lack of use. Right. But, but again, you're, as a physician, you're trying to establish a rapport with the patient. The first thing you say, hey, I'm, I know you're here for your, your infection, you know, your pneumonia. Let's talk about organ donation. You want to give your organs? I mean, yeah, I, I mean, from a practical standpoint, yeah, I mean, that'd be great if you could do that, especially ER physicians. They're, 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 those guys are the most overworked. They have the shortest amount of time to see a patient because they're just trying to see a wide variety of very sick people. But yeah, I mean, uh, ideally, primary care physicians, when you see a patient on a routine follow-up visit, um, that would be the ideal time to discuss that. And you know, whether we pass that as a law as a society, I think it would be a reasonable thing to do. Unfortunately, anytime you pass another law, it's another level of red tape, and you know, well, try I mean, to streamline. I think we passed too many laws right. mandating this stuff. Right, know? right. But I'm talking about you as a physician. Right. You it depends. It depends on what, you know, I usually am trying to get them to quit smoking. I mean, the big thing, seriously, I mean, I, you know, I, I spend half my time getting them to try to lose weight. Most of my patients are overweight. Most of the patients smoke. And so I spend the majority of my time trying to get them better, you know. And most of my patients are not going to be heart transplant candidates because they all have heart disease. Most of them smoke. They have lung disease. So they can't really donate their lungs. Their kidneys may be. A lot of diabetics I see, most of their kidneys are not viable organs. It's a very small percentage of people that are actually 1% of deaths that are actually organ transplant patients. And again, those are usually between the 20, 50 year age group. Well, perhaps we should consider the United States going to an opt out kind of law where you're automatically in an organ donation unless you opt out. And everybody knows that. Would that help solve the problem? Now, is that a viable thing to try to push in our Congress? Well, uh, good question. In, in most of the countries I'm aware of in Europe, have a uniform, a, a universal health care system. So it, that's where it's taken care of. The, the patient and financial. family pay up to the point that the, that the patient's declared brain dead. Brain From dead. that point on, it's actually like their insurance paying while they're sitting there on a ventilator. Right, up until and the point of their dead. Right. 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 Okay, and so then at some point, are you not? talk about the slippery slope, at some point somebody's going to say, well, I give you an extra $5,000 if you, know, you harvest the liver and you send it over here. I mean, so if, once that money starts going back and forth, you've got to always follow the money. Yeah. Well, in America, you couldn't do that because all the, any organs that are donated, they have to go through the registry, so they can't be black marketed. But, but the other countries... The was yeah. if you go to an opt-out. Right. Uh, in Europe, Traditionally, is a lot more community organ, and we're very independent in our thinking. You know, we're individualistic, and that's that's why we don't do that in America. And I'm not saying that's the right thing; it's just the why we don't. The personal autonomy value is the dominant value in the United States, no question. The social justice value is the dominant value in most European countries. Quite different, and they're in conflict. Question. Just a quick question out of curiosity for uh, true luck. Um, why exactly does a 
lot of the ICU stay, these, you know, surgery actually to harvest the, the organ, to transplant the organ, the medicines. Uh, you have to use anti-transplant medicines. Uh, you have to speak, you have to see a cardiac uh, transplant specialist. Um, so it's a lot of the, the actual operation itself, harvesting the organ. Imagine you have to harvest, well, LifePoint, I don't know, y'all bear that cost. Let's say if you harvest the organ here, it has to be flown to Charleston to be implanted. Um, I mean, there, there's a lot of costs that just add up pretty quickly. Do you quickly. know, could you identify a, a main or a set of main substantial costs that constitute that figure? I, I would say that a lot of the costs post-transplant are the medications. Yes, there's all the technology involved in the transplant and the ICU and all of that, but the steroids that are used to, um, to prevent the rejection are very costly. And so if you look at a cost of a, of, now the initial, I don't, I don't think the initial transplant itself cost a um, million dollars unless you really have a patient who is sick and has to remain in the ICU because we're getting patients out of the ICU a lot sooner now. As a matter of fact, kidney patient normally routinely may stay in the um, hospital maybe three days. And then they're, um, they're discharged to a, to a location close to the transplant center, but it's not as costly as staying in the transplant center. Um, kidney transplant itself probably costs anywhere from $75,000 to $100,000 that first year. Liver can be $250,000, $300,000. Heart, lung, maybe $450,000 to $500,000. Do you think the medications are? Medications are extremely expensive, yes. But all the technology is expensive as well. Can the cost of the heart itself, for the recovery of the heart, for the transportation, and all the things that go into actually recovering a heart is about $28,000. Because we do reimburse the hospital for all the cost associated with the donation, which can be anywhere from sixty dollars to $100,000 in itself, just the hospital cost. You've had your hand up. Yeah, I, one of the other things in terms of the ethics of the transplants and Thank you. 
really negative cases are going to be responsible for people getting angry and then saying, I'm not going to donate, and then we're actually going to see a rebound, decrease in organ donations because people are going to see this one big thing. TV shows nowadays are presenting organ donation in a bad line. So far. You know, all these people about stealing organs and stuff. And it's like, because it makes it more interesting. It's just, you know, when plastic surgeons it's like what they do with Nip Tuck. I'm sorry that doesn't really happen. What they do with this transplant stuff on TV, most of them don't happen. And so I think that, I think that part of this issue thing was to, to bring this into discussion. Everybody needs to know what's going on and to educate ourselves on what's going on. But I think we need to be really careful because we are the United Swiss said it when we were talking about how they have nationalized health care and we don't. They say Americans are full of people who rejected them because they didn't want to look like this. So they came here and it's against our basic personality. You sit against your genes. We're very, very independent. And I think, I think if you try to do something like that, you're actually going to see a tremendous rebound. And that's what concerns me is that we do pretty good with it if you have, because most people are very gentle. I think one of the biggest things that, that we face in real practice, however, that, that I think the registry can help overcome is, I don't know, how often would you say that most families, when there's no registry involved or, or no donor card or no one really knows what the deceased wanted to do, the hardest decision for most of the families that deny consent is that they really don't know what that loved one would do. Yeah, but once you sign it, if the family is really adamant about not, even though it's a contract with the patient, I think that it's going to be a candidate. Because if that person's dead, he's not going to have an advocate. And nobody's going to be, going to, he's not going to be serving anybody. It's but, the family that is. And that's my concern. But if, he's, if, if he signs, uh, on his own, when he's mentally capable of making these decisions, he is his own advocate. He does not need an advocate. Yes, but I'm able. saying in the, in the real practical nature of it, I'm saying that if the family didn't want him to, and he did it, and he's not able to speak, if we take his organs when the family is adamant and making noise and saying, I'm going to sue you and the hospital well, that, that happened. That, that's already happened in in, full, in uh, Pittsburgh. Yeah, Pittsburgh. The uh, 18 year old was an 18 year old that, that died, and the the she had. Uh, I think she she not given consent, or maybe she had. Uh, I forget about. I just remember hearing the case. But well, actually, this has been threatened, but there's never been but one that actually, out. But that was actually a lawsuit was carried out. About that. We are going to have to talk time in just a second because I've only what we call uh, women, the recital hall until six, and somebody may have a class in here. But Cher has her, had her hand up the whole time. This is just a quick question, um, a, a, a maybe clarification. LifePoint is a, is a state function? You, what's your funding to make? You do the state or you're not? No, we're not a state organization. Yes. We're a nonprofit organization that's de um, designated by the federal government to cover South Carolina as a designated service area. There are 58 of us in this country that all function similarly. Okay, and so you're working on grant money or? No, our funding comes through the transplant programs. We have standard costs that are, are evaluated each year, and we have standard costs for each organ. And those organ um, uh, recovery fees are billed to the transplant programs. That gets incorporated into the patients um, hospitalization, and then we get reimbursed through the transplant program. And, and you, so, you've had your hand up. I'll leave you here with one impression. It seems to me that we have to have we have a tremendous educational problem. Uh, TV is a, a this is a terrible subject to talk about, but we have to talk about it. But education, I have a little heart on my driver's license. I don't know what that means. <laughs> Honestly, I didn't know either. I'm a doctor, and I didn't know until I, I did this research. I mean, I, I said, okay, you're an organ donor. I didn't know the extent of the legality of it. Nobody's, they don't give us, I mean, I'm glad I did this talk because I know a lot, a lot more about it. Um, and even this, until I was the head of the ethics committee, I didn't realize this was an issue with a change in the law. 
they didn't notify us about a change in the law that, that uh, for organ do donation, the, the government doesn't, you know, we get, you should see my mail, I get you know, tons and tons of, of junk mail every day. There's no way to know that. But the problem is communicating to physicians, number one, communicating communicate to the community at, at large, number two, to allow them to know what is going on. And the mass media is not doing a good job. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're a horrible job. And you think they're, they're going the other way, the way we should be going. Um, we as physicians need to be doing a better job. It's, you know, we're getting pushed and pushed. And it's a big, how, how is healthcare going to be delivered in 2010? Nobody really knows right now. Um, so there's a lot of issues going on. Dr. Go, you got last comment. No, it's just that, I mean, that's what this is for. This is, this is really for education. And the problem is that we, we can't do it for are now coming to us and saying, talk about this. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. No, if Bowen that. would love to do it, Kimberly <laughs> said. I'm glad I could, really. So. Um, I hate to call time, but we have to leave the room. If you want to hang around and there are some more questions for you while we clean up, that's just fine. Thank you all. <laughs> next three amendments next month. Thanks so much. I've got to run to, to take my kids to a concert. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm sorry. Much.